Good evening, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. You're watching Alaska Weather with us on the 18th of September. And as always, we encourage you to stay up to date with your local weather information. That's easily done by calling us at the Alaska Weather Information Line. 1-800-472-0391 is how you use that. And of course, write down the numbers as you are listening to the telephone prompts. And you can get through that system a little bit faster if that's not something you've tried before. As always, you can find us online as well, weather.gov slash Alaska. One click on the map will get you to your weather forecast office that serves you uh, closest to, in proximity to your location, of course, and with the best expertise to take care of your community for all your weather and safety needs there. If you have any questions, you can't find what you're looking for, you're curious how to get to a stream gauge or look up the most recent information from an uh, earthquake from the National Tsunami Warning Center, Please let me know. You can find me anytime at david.snyder at noaa.gov. I am always happy to talk with folks around Alaska, to see the pictures of your community and village, and to help solve weather problems and concerns that you may have regarding the show or anything else that we do around Alaska. So please let me know. Let's take a look, look at what's going on across your region tonight. Wind advisories are the issue for the eastern Alaska range and uh, the upper 40 mile country and uh, areas around the Yukon Flats there. And we're talking about winds that are coming up from the south and the east as they blow through tonight and into tomorrow. Don't be surprised to see gusts anywhere from 45 to about 60 miles per hour. Uh, blustery situation as low pressure is pulling through south central out ahead of that. Uh, a lot of wind traveling through some of the gaps and the passes of the higher terrain and even some of the lowlands there. So be careful driving and certainly plan for a choppy flight if you are moving through that part of the country. Out across the west, fire danger remains high. Now, we have seen a lot of rain across the west, south central, and certainly now parts of the central and eastern interior over the last several weeks. A lot of things have improved, and we no longer have south central or the Copper River uh, Valley featured on this map. But as we look at some of the fire weather danger maps there, we're still watching some marginal, maybe high, levels of dryness across the region. And so with that and some wind moving through the area, uh, high fire danger is noted on the map for this 18th of September, and again, uh, we are very near the end of the season, but it's still in season, and it's still uh, especially uh, important to be careful with fire there. So the focus today would be across the middle Yukon uh, to the Kobuk and Notak Valley, the very southern edge there, all the way up into uh, parts of the coastal regions of the uh, Norton Sound area and southern Seward Peninsula, and even the interior of the Seward Peninsula at this point. Be careful with fire. Here's a look at the satellite picture, and I'll pause it here for just a minute. This is the visible satellite picture, and we are nearing that time of the season where we're just not getting as much on our imagery because we're losing a tremendous amount of daylight each day. But still, the visible satellite picture is one of the best tools for seeing some beautiful cloud features across Alaska. And in this case, we see low pressure dragging up a deep fetch of Pacific moisture into south central and southeastern Alaska combined with colder air dropping out across the Bering Sea and another area of low pressure quickly moving into the central and western Aleutians. Uh, the ripples that you see in the texture right here is convection. That is upward moving air really building up the clouds. You can see that also forming here across the Gulf of Alaska. As some of that moisture is meeting up with the colder air coming in, we're seeing that kind of speckled effect take uh, shape here across the Gulf and also uh, similar conditions here across the West, a sign that colder air is quickly moving in behind the weather system. Uh, and up north, if you look carefully here, that is fresh snow across the Brooks Range. And no surprise, uh, given the recent turn of events and that uh, southerly moving cold air into the Alaska Range. If you were moving through the Denali region as I was in the last couple days for the road lottery, uh, it was uh, certainly snowy up there as we worked through uh, Monday night and into Tuesday. Now behind that, a lot of cloud cover. We've got another weather system that should help produce a copious amount of rainfall across the southwest, south central, and southeastern coastal communities as we go into the remainder of the week. One of these still pulling through uh, does look like it will feature quite a bit of rainfall as we work into the end of the week. In the meantime, wind out ahead of this is going to be the primary issue for the eastern Alaska range and some parts of the upper Yukon Valley. 
and southeast is getting ready to look at the widespread rainfall there and at times some gusty conditions around uh, Haines all the way up toward Yakutat perhaps. Gusts there up to 40 miles per hour. Probably somewhat brief as we head into the overnight hours and uh, just as they move in they'll probably move out. Your forecast today shows that 989 millibar low working through south central and the upper Susitna Valley working right over the Alaska Range pushing rain into northern parts of southeast. Periods of heavy rain around Prince William Sound, Seward up through Anchorage and uh, into the Matanuska and Susitna Valleys at times today and certainly out ahead of that. Behind that Indian Mountain reporting snow today, so some uh, lower terrain uh, locations uh, getting a little bit of snow. And another weather system across the North Slope kind of combining with the main center that's working its way through South Central now. And as I showed on the satellite picture, another one coming in right behind it, that at 983 millimars. As we get into tonight, uh, the main feature quickly moves into the western and northern parts of the Yukon. Showers linger across southeast. It may be rain for a time, but it becomes a little more showery in nature as we go through overnight. Uh, the central and eastern parts of southern Alaska also remain showery and windy for sure, especially across the higher terrain. And then out across the west, we'll start to focus on the next feature that's working into the central Aleutians at 994 millibars. It is cold enough for areas around Kaktovik, maybe Arctic Village, to look at snow showers. Most areas in the west and northwest have the opportunity to see rain and snow mix. More likely that you're going to see that mix and probably some poor visibility at times. Watch for eye of hard conditions there on the flying chart in just a bit. Uh, areas of fog should descend down the west coast as uh, more stable air starts to work its way in briefly from parts of the bearing. As we move into your Thursday, low pressure is still going to dawdle across the Alcan border here around 1,003 millibars. You'll see kind of a split system. Here's the system that's moving through right now. That's moving quickly into western Canada. The next feature, though, is really going to hang out around the jet stream, which is just south of Alaska, but really powerful stuff. And it looks like it's going to reach a lot of Pacific moisture and pull that in to this next weather system in the western Gulf. At 992 millibars, you can see the pressure gradient packing in here across the southern Gulf. And what that means is more winds coming in with this system. And it looks like it will have a moisture-rich environment, so plenty of rain possible out ahead of that and along the path of this low, which looks like it'll be heading to the north and to the east. So while a ridge is trying to build here across southeast, it may become a little more showery and gloomy. Plenty of cloud cover still overhead for parts of southeast and maybe some breaks in that wet weather. Out behind that, an open door for some colder air to move through. Not entirely open, but at least it's kind of nudged open. Somebody left a crack in the door there as most of the cold is still banked up here across parts of the Chukchi Sea. And you can see the precipitation changes there along the Beaufort Sea coast and into the Chukchi Sea where rain and snow is creeping ever closer to the coastline. Some of that probably working its way into Ukiavik, out toward Prudhoe Bay and Dead Horse and Kakovic. Uh, for your Thursday afternoon. By Friday, uh, the colder air is still locked up in the north, but that weather system we have across the east is kind of joining forces here. So you'll notice these pressure centers dropping quickly again by Friday afternoon, down to about 978 millibars. That deep southerly fetch full of moisture works its way into southeast. Plan for rain as we wrap up the week there in southeast. Plan for wind as well. It looks like places like Yakutat and Haines, as I mentioned, will have an opportunity for more wind uh, probably some stronger wind in your region, and probably a, a good helping of rainfall across the central and even southern parts of the inside passage there. So plan on some soggy weather. For parts of south central, the Copper River Valley, all the way out to Shelikoff Strait, and really the Alaska Peninsula, you'll notice that pressure gradient really packing in here as well. So it does look like there's going to be an opportunity for wind for just about everyone in southern Alaska and southwest as we go toward the end of the week. This should produce some more sunnier weather across the west coast, and Kobuk and Noatak Valleys, the upper Koyukuk as well. So you'll see some improvement on your flying weather charts, but there may still be some turbulence. It looks like Thursday's turbulence weather uh, on the chart there is really pretty benign. Not a whole lot of issues with that. But as we get into Friday, that's going to flip exactly the other way. It looks like southeast, south central, and probably the Alaska range, at very least, are going to be looking at some widespread moderate turbulence and most likely some uh, small cases of severe. So if you're looking at Friday to fly, there's a lot of issues with uh, perhaps uh, choosing Friday over Thursday, so choose wisely. We'll have that aviation forecast up in a minute. As you look at the forecast tonight, 50s for southeast, south central, 40s for the most part, 50 around Kodiak, upper 40s for the Alaska Peninsula, uh, Sandpoint, all the way out toward the Aleutians. Up north and north of the Alaska Range especially, look at the cold weather setting in. You can see temps dropping into the 20s for the Brooks Range, uh, the Koyukuk Valley easily below freezing all the way up toward Ambler, 39 around Kivalina and Cotsview. Attempts just at or above freezing.
for the north slope. As we get into the afternoon tomorrow, upper 50s for many locations, south central probably the mid 50s there again with rain cool air still lingering. Just shy of 60 in Kodiak, 50s for most in the west and southwest, 51 around St. Paul southeast. You're looking at temperatures holding in the mid-50s. Not a big change during the day, it looks like. And the north slope, you'll probably see temps in the 30s to maybe the lower to mid-40s there as you get into Kotzebue Sound. By Friday morning, temps are dipping once again into the 20s for Arctic Village, uh, Anaktuvik Pass. Bettles, 28 degrees there. Kotzebue Sound, back to about 40 degrees. Lower 30s for the Beaufort Seacoast, including Prudhoe Bay, Dead Horse, Kaktovik. Southeast, 40s and 50s for you. South Central, lower 40s to about 50 degrees. And upper 40s for the southwest and parts of the chain there as we start up your Friday morning. By the afternoon, 50s and 60s for Southeast. 50s for South Central, 58 in Kodiak, 56 for Eagle. Uh, Fairbanks looking at 54 degrees. Galena, only 46 degrees. Shishmara, 44 and upper 30s and lower 40s for the North Slope, including Ukiavik at 43 degrees, 50 again in St. Paul. As we look at the climate outlook into the 8 to 14 day period, this ends October 2nd. It does look like warmer than average weather is possible on the west and southwest, not so much across the eastern areas, and wetter than normal weather, a lot more possible for west and the central region. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. And on to aviation weather now, IFR conditions are expected to be fairly widespread across the central and western chain and up the Aleutian uh, chain into Bristol Bay, the Alaska Range, and snaking over into the Copper River Valley. All of southeast will start out with IFR in the morning. Coastal areas may be lucky and sneak out with some marginal conditions, and that should extend back into Cook Inlet and around Kodiak Island. A lot of the interior will start out with marginal conditions. Uh, some areas around Fairbanks, likely IFR conditions, or it'll be close by anyway. And most of the Beaufort Seacoast into the Eastern Brooks Range, likely IFR. Kotzebue Sound also looking at an MVFR start as we get into your Thursday. By the afternoon, marginal conditions, if you have problems, that, that'll be what you see across the interior, most of the Yukon Valley, and certainly the Kuskokwim Valley. Bristol Bay, Kodiak linger under marginal conditions, and IFR sets into parts of Prince William Sound with Southeast looking at improvement throughout your afternoon. IFR conditions pull off of the Beaufort Seacoast, but still very close to Utkiavik and Wainwright. And then south and west, most of the chain again back under IFR conditions from just about, oh, let's say the Schumigan Islands and points east, and then all the way west into the central and western chain, uh, just about to Shemu, looking at IFR. As we get into Friday morning, look for hit and miss IFR across some of your Alaska range passes. Most areas will see some other options available with marginal conditions for most of South Central, including Cook Inlet all the way down to Kodiak Island. Once again, Southeast sets in under IFR conditions. Most of the Yukon opens up to VFR. Most of the south facing slopes of the Brooks Range are at least marginal conditions with IFR across the Kobach. Kobuk and Noatak Valley uh, regions and especially the slopes nearby. Hit and miss marginal weather there out across the west with St. Paul and St. George looking at MVFR. You'll see that hole still kind of lingering out around the Pribilofs by the afternoon. Some, some good news there across the west coast. Interior locations for the most part, at least VFR, but you'll see marginal conditions sneaking in across some of your western capes. IFR lingers across some of the uh, Bering Sea coastline of the Alaska Peninsula. Up around Icy Cape and Cape Fairweather, IFR conditions there. And from just about Sitka all the way down through Port Alexander and Craig Cloak uh, areas across the outer coast looking at IFR. Marginal weather across the inside passage for your afternoon on Friday. Here's your pass conditions and in detail for Thursday now. An IFR start for Anaktuvik and Adigan Pass. We do expect to see substantial improvement by the afternoon, so some hope there. Lake Clark and Merrill Pass looks like an IFR start with some marginal improvement throughout the day. A uh, rainy pass looking at IFR in the morning, marginal in the afternoon. IFR for Windy Pass really most of the day is expected. Isabel Pass should also see some improvement as the afternoon goes on. Mentasta Pass may reach VFR by the afternoon, so a marginal start, uh, not all you'll see during the day. Taneda Pass looking at IFR to start with some improvement to marginal conditions by the afternoon. Portage Pass may stay IFR on the east side really all day long. And Chilkoot and White Pass also looking for some improvement, but a low start in the morning at IFR. Here's your freezing levels now, and surface freezing line is showing all the way down south of the Brooks Range to just about the Yukon Valley and into the uh, Norton Sound region by the morning. The 2,000 to 4,000 foot levels are taking over most of the west coast, so certainly some cool air dropping south. Uh, levels over the Gulf of Alaska anywhere from 6, 8 to 10,000 feet stretching into southeastern Alaska and a little bit of a cool pool lingering around south central at around 6,000 feet or below 
for tomorrow morning. Icing potential, well, the moisture in place is certainly there and levels are coming down, so we know that at least 7 to about 8,000 feet in general for isolated moderate icing potential is there from uh, the Yukon Valley in the east all the way down to south central, Bristol Bay, and probably just about to the Kuskokoum Delta there, just south of Bethel for your afternoon, and then hit and miss out around St. Matthew, St. Paul, and St. George with levels there again between 7 and 8,000 feet. The jet stream has a ridge of high pressure sitting across the Gulf and the, west, or the eastern Pacific. Strong southwesterly flow coming in is bringing in a great deal of moisture across the region, and that trend will continue again tomorrow. Strong westerlies coming into the Pacific are also blowing more storm energy our way. Low pressure sitting across southwest is pulling in uh, weather from the south around 20 to 50 knots at 9,000 feet. Westerlies coming ashore at 15 to 30. Southwesterlies across the Brooks Range 10 to 20. And northwesterlies coming in again across the uh, western bearing anywhere from 10 to 20 knots there. Low pressure sitting across the western seacoast anywhere from 10 knots there. Uh, also working with other areas of low pressure all rotating around this larger center. A stronger southerly flow across the Gulf keeps the moisture coming in from 15 to as strong as 60 knots and really slowing down as it moves into southeast under the ridge of high pressure there. 20 knots southerlies across the interior, 5 to 10, and more of a southwesterly flow in northwestern Alaska. Turbulence then, right now it looks like things are getting better as we go into Thursday, so not as bad as what we've seen today. The outer coast of southeast, south central, Kodiak, southwest, and the chain all looking at some minor chop below 4,000 feet. The Yukon Flats National Wildlife Refuge is a refuge in Alaska. It's the third largest refuge in the National Wildlife Refuge system. North of Fairbanks, it's a vast ecosystem of wetlands. What drives this refuge are natural forces of fire, ice, and water. The Yukon Flats has got a really interesting history. Back in the late 50s, early 1960s, there was a proposal to dam the Yukon River down by Rampart, which is downstream of the Yukon Flats and it was a hydroelectric proposal. And so in order to assess the merits of that proposal, people got together because they were a little bit concerned about what the impacts might be on the Yukon Flats, the habitat, and all the people living within the Yukon Flats refuge. There's quite a few people living within the refuge. You have seven villages. So in order to figure out how special the Yukon Flats was, the Fish and Wildlife Service banded over 40,000 ducks within the Yukon Flats. And using the band return information, they found out that those ducks were using 45 of the 50 lower 48 states. They were using seven foreign countries, and they were using most of the provinces over in Canada, as well as all the major flyways down in the lower 48. And so that identified that the Yukon Flats was a special breeding area. And that information, along with a lot of other public information that was gathered during that whole process really ensured that the dam never did go in and thus the habitat was preserved. So what that did is it really highlighted the national importance of this area and how important conserving this particular area is for conserving many other natural areas in the lower 48 and even across the continent. Refuge because we have responsibility towards our future generations to leave land protected um, in the state that it is now. The Yukon Flats is a wild place. The ecosystem is intact and functioning and you can't find that very many places in the rest of the U.S. The Yukon Flats Refuge is among the most important places for ducks. So each spring, millions of ducks, and in addition to shorebirds and geese, raptors and loons, they all fly to the refuge to nest and rear their young and 
the reason they are attracted to this area is because it has really enriched wetlands. There are lots of nutrients in the wetlands that provide a lot of food for the growing young. We also have a lot of um, predator, prey species like bears and black bears, grizzly bears, wolves. We also have a lot of moose and fur bearers that use the refuge. So overall there's just a great diversity of both upland, lowland, and migratory bird species that use the refuge. Most people know the flats as a duck nursery um, and that was one of the main purposes that was designed for but a lot of recent research over the last decade has really illustrated how important it is to a variety of native endemic fish species for subsistence and recreational and commercial fisheries throughout the entire Yukon River Basin and out to supporting commercial fisheries out to the Bering Sea as well. So it, it, it supports a variety of different whitefish and salmon species, the northern pike, a uh, little bit of everything that people rely on as cultural identities but also for subsistence resources and where people go to, to recreate and enjoy being outside. So the type of recreation that you're going to find on Yukon Flats Refuge is very primitive. And what that often does is it gives people a complete break from some of the stresses of today's world. There are no cell phone towers out there, there are no roads, there are no trails. So any type of recreation that people have is entirely natural. The lands and waters within the Yukon Flats National Wildlife Refuge are open to the public to enjoy. And that's a really important tenant upon which the United States is built. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Back with your marine weather now, we continue to watch the melting of the marginal ice there that is within 350 to 400, maybe 500 nautical miles now north of Utkiavik and Kaktovik, a substantial reduction of the sea ice as we've seen in recent years uh, at this Date. So uh, we continue to watch that carefully. Uh, the marginal ice that you see here is, is not refreezing. This is, again, just kind of ice that's caught up in the Beaufort Gyre. For the very latest information and seasonal outlook, head to weather.gov slash anchorage slash ice for the Alaska Sea Ice Program. As we look at southeast, so we're expecting gusty winds up the Lynn Canal from the south, 35 knots there. Uh, Haines and, again, Yakutat have uh, kind of some strong wind wording there in your local forecast information, so don't be surprised to have a brief period of gusts overnight. That should taper off quickly into the early morning hours, but what's left behind are those gusts up to 35 uh, knots as we go into the afternoon tomorrow. Three to four foot seas on the inside, generally 15 to 20 knots sustained. An onshore flow up to 20 knots from 8 to 10 foot seas expected with that on Thursday. And as we get into Friday, a much stronger flow coming into low pressure, as you can see just south of Prince William Sound. 35 to 45 knots there uh, and looking at about 13 to 15 foot seas across the outer coast on the inside gusts to 35 even 40 knots there around Stevens Passage with a 5 to 6 foot sea in the region 3 foot seas for the Lynn Canal, one of the less breezy spots as you get into your Friday weather. For Thursday, across South Central, light winds in Prince William Sound, 10 knots, 2 foot seas. Southerlies coming up Cook Inlet, 20 to 25, 4 to 5 foot seas there on your Thursday. For Friday, look for a stronger flow again across the northern Gulf, all wrapping around that low pressure system that we just saw really impacting southeast. On the back side of that, there was a 15 to 30 knot wind from the north and northwest. The gustiest winds will be through the channel terrain and the gaps and passes. 30 to 35 knots there across the north and western Gulf and outside of Resurrection Bay, 35 knots and 12 foot seas there, and northerlies at 30 knots with 6 foot seas in Prince William Sound. For southwest, southwesterlies working through Shelikoff Strait, 5 foot seas on the straight side, on the Gulf side, 10 foot seas there with a 20 knot wind, southwesterlies coming into Bristol Bay, and east and southeasterlies across the Alaska Peninsula. Uh, Pacific waters there, 7 to 10 foot seas for you. On Friday, a stronger northwesterly flow kind of evens out across the region, though 25 knots, 5 to 7 foot seas generally from Shelikoff Strait into the Bering, and 8 to 9 foot seas there across the Pacific waters, all with northwesterlies. 
As we look at Thursday in the chain, an east and northerly flow is still working on the back side of that low pressure system coming off the bearing. 15 to 25 knots in the region with 12 to 13 foot seas across the Pacific waters. And then northerlies coming across the west, anywhere from 11 to 13 foot seas on that 20 to 25 knot wind. As we get into Friday, the winds diminish out in the west, become a little more variable, and you can see high pressure taking over a north and westerly flow working into the central and eastern chain. 7 to 8 foot seas across the region and 4 to 5 foot seas across the central and eastern coastlines of the Bering on Friday. For the west, northerlies coming off of St. Lawrence Island and out of the Bering Strait, northeasterlies out of the Bethel and the Kuskokwim Delta, uh, southerlies working over St. Paul and St. George, 10 knots and 4 foot seas there, light winds across Norton Sound as well. As you get into Friday, uh, the high pressure ridge is still working in that west and northwesterly flow here. Uh, the main corridor of low pressure is still sitting across the Gulf, so we're drawing all this air and across the west coast. It'll be a little bit cooler. You might see some breaks in the clouds, though, anywhere from three to four foot seas in the north and five to six foot seas a little bit further south into the Kuskokwim Delta, St. Matthew, and Pribilof Island waters. As you look at the north slope, look for an offshore flow from Prudhoe Bay to Kaktovik on Thursday. North and easterly winds coming down the Chukchi Coast and westerlies coming in from Cape Lisburn all the way into Kotzebue Sound, 10 to 15 knots there. Four foot seas expected for Thursday. By Friday, an easterly flow working across the Beaufort, 10 to 15, expecting three to four foot seas and a south and westerly flow coming up the Chukchi Coast, anywhere from 10 to 15 with four to five foot seas there on Friday. Recapping tonight's weather, we're watching one weather system work its way quickly into north and western parts of Canada. That should create an onshore flow for many parts of southeast and continue the wet weather across the region. Behind that is cold air and still some snow showers across some of the eastern Brooks Range. We've been watching some snow showers around uh, parts of the central interior as well this afternoon. There will continue to be showers working through south central and southwest, but a new weather system is coming in behind that. This should start to deepen as we work into your Thursday at 992 millibars. This is gathering more Pacific moisture behind it, and as it quickly moves up into south central, we expect that to drop to about 978 millibars. Gales at least, and maybe some low end storm force winds across parts of the Gulf. Watch for periods of moderate to occasionally heavy rain for southeast and continued periods of gusts and rain for south central. Meanwhile, the cold air stays locked up across the Chukchi. While it will be cool in the north, not the big cold that comes for winter. Take care. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbormaster before you go boating. Thank you.